Hi folks, my name is Loretta Johnston and I'm here from the Baltimore Department of Public Waste. Thank you for coming out to our community meeting tonight. I've got a few words to say about the waste collection here in Baltimore. First, there's the sorted collection bins themselves. They're made of sturdy solid material so none of your trash can seep out or puncture the bin. Also, since these things sit out on the curb overnight, rain or shine, they have to be waterproof. We can't have water getting up in it and filling up the bin. Remember to pay attention to which bin is which and sort your waste accordingly. You should have a blue or green bin for recyclable garbage, a yellow bin for unrecyclable garbage and a red bin for toxic waste. Our citywide waste management is divided into two services. The first is commercial waste collection, or trash collection from buildings. The majority of building waste is paper, which goes in the blue or green bins. You'll notice in your office buildings there are signs that warn you not to overfill these bins. All that paper adds up, and an overflowing bin is infinitely harder for collectors to carry to the truck and empty. Aside from paper, another large source of building waste is metals. Metals such as tin and aluminium can be put in the yellow recycle bins, but metals like lead and copper should be disposed of in the red bins. These heavy metals are harmful to the environment and exacerbate our city's existing pollution problem. That's about all the information you need for building waste. Moving on to the second service, household waste collection is probably what you primarily think of when you think of what we do here. Many of the same guidelines apply, the sorting is the same, etc. Please remember to keep garbage like kitchen waste in a plastic bag. It makes collection easier and lessens the abominable rotten trash smell. So, after we take your trash away, what happens to it? We take all the garbage to one of a number of garbage disposal plants, each of which is located in the middle of an open space of some sort. No one wants to have their home or office right next door to a waste disposal plant, right? Waste is collected and then disposed of once every four weeks. A lot of trash can build up in that time, so we're in the process of developing a plan to fund collection more frequently. Ideally, it would be collected weekly, but we will likely have to settle for bi-weekly. The garbage trucks make their rounds to clear the bins at night in order to avoid traffic. I'm sure you've seen how much waste your own household produces in a given week. Now imagine all the trash produced by all the households in Baltimore. It's a lot, right? It may surprise you that this amount is only marginal compared to commercial waste. Yep, the main waste producers are actually businesses, industrial facilities, retail and offices. Hard to believe humans produce that much waste, right? No wonder we have pollution problems. Anyway, after all incoming waste is sorted, recyclables are sent to a recycling plant, while garbage and toxic waste are transported to their respective areas of the plant for treatment. Items such as stones, which should not be disposed of in our bins, are separated out and discarded. Once the trash has undergone the treatment process, it is compacted and disposed of with all the other trash. And finally, when the landfill space is full, it is buried deep underground and in time, something new is built on the land. That's everything about waste collection. Thank you for listening. Are there any questions? Hi, Julie, it's Ricky. Hi, Ricky. How are you? I noticed you weren't in psychology today. I'm feeling sick, so I didn't go to school today. Would you mind telling me what I missed in class? Sure thing. I'm sorry you're not feeling well. Anyway, we spent most of the class talking about a new essay that Professor Johnson assigned. You need to choose one of the bold headings from the note system and research it. Wow, I picked the wrong day to miss class, huh? You sure did. Could you tell me the specific requirements of this paper? Sure. You need to find scientific research that supports your claim as one of your references. It can be from some of the case studies we discussed in class, or you can find your own. Or even better, you can conduct your own research. I'm sure that would get you an A. Have you decided what you're going to do yet? Also, where are you getting your references? Yeah, I'm going to research facial recognition by infants. I've already found a few experiments in scientific journals. 
that would probably be a good start for you. There are tons of journals in the library. Great idea. Thanks. I'm considering writing my essay on the effects of one of the psychotropic drugs we talked about in class. I'm sure there is lots of stuff about it on the internet. Are we allowed to use information from the internet? Sure, you can use that as long as it's not your main source for information. You'll probably want to cite some of the experiments we went over. Good idea, thanks. I'm going to try to find some information from a bunch of different sources. Are there any specifications on how the essay should be written? Yeah, Professor Johnson wants it double spaced. It should be between six to ten pages long. Six to ten pages. That's so much. Oh, it's going to take forever. I know. The whole class groaned when he said that. Anyway, you also need to put the title in italics. And wait, wait. Each section heading, or just the main heading? Only the main heading should be in italics. I think section titles are supposed to be in the same format, but maybe in bold. You'll have to check that in class next time. Oh, okay. So I take it that the report has to be typed, since there are so many requirements. What are the other formatting requirements? Yep, it's got to be typed. Aside from that, there are still a few more specifications. You should number each page. Make sure it goes up in the top right corner. Okay, I'll make sure to write that down. I always forget to number the pages. Do we need to title and date each page too? You need the shortened title on every page, but no need to include the date. That should just be on the cover page. Okay, thanks. No problem. Also, make sure the margins are three point two five pixels wide. What? I'm not even sure how to do that. It's okay. I can show you. It's really easy. I think that's all the directions he gave us. A lot of formatting requirements, but we have the freedom to research many things that we like, so that's good. Oh, I almost forgot. Remember to put down your ID number on your report. Thanks so much for your help. I'll see you in class Monday. No problem. Glad I could help. See you later. Good afternoon, and welcome to Habitat Hunters. You must be Joseph. Yes, that's right. You said on the phone that I could come by at two o'clock. Sorry, I'm a little early. No,、oh, no problem at all. In Calgary's market, you have to move fast if you want a good apartment. Actually, I'd settle for almost anything. I've been here ten days, and the hotel is ruining me. My father has me on a strict budget. Sit right down here now, sir. Let's talk a little about the places before we go have a look. Now we have four apartments available. Okay. Could you tell me more about those four apartments? Sure. The first one is on Beetle Road, just a block off campus. It's a three bedroom with a bathroom and a living room and a great Italian restaurant right next to it. The agent says that the first apartment is a three bedroom apartment with a great Italian restaurant right next to it. So restaurant has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen. Because you will not hear the recording a second time, listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good afternoon, and welcome to Habitat Hunters. You must be Joseph. Yes, that's right. You said on the phone that I could come by at two o'clock. Sorry, I'm a little early. No,、oh, no problem at all. In Calgary's market, you have to move fast if you want a good apartment. Actually, I'd settle for almost anything. I've been here ten days, and the hotel is ruining me. My father has me on a strict budget. Sit right down here now, sir. Let's talk a little about the places before we go have a look. Now we have four apartments available. Okay. Could you tell me more about those four apartments? Sure. The first one is on Beetle Road, just a block off campus. It's a three bedroom with a bathroom and a living room and a great Italian restaurant right next to it. How much? Well, it's four hundred and thirty-five dollars a month, including internet and utilities. Okay, that sounds reasonable. Any drawbacks to the house? There's a really big garden, but it hasn't been taken care of over the years, and is just too big to clean up nicely. Hmm, that sounds okay. Tell me about the next option. The other three-bedroom apartment is on Oakington Avenue on campus. It is right near the building where you have classes, and the kitchen and living room are newly furnished. Wow, 
That sounds like a pretty good option. Well, it is a cool apartment, but since it's a dormitory, the living room, bathroom, kitchen, and washing machine are all shared. It would be nice not to have to buy living room furniture, though. And how much is this one? Four hundred dollars per month for a bedroom with an air conditioner. For a bedroom without an air conditioner, you would pay less, three hundred and forty dollars for it. Yikes! Even with the air conditioner, it sounds really inconvenient to have to share facilities. I'll never cook if I have to walk down the hall to use the kitchen. Yeah, that's true. Before you hear, wait. The next place is a two-bedroom on Mead Street. Oh, I like Mead Street. That's off campus, right? Yep, it's pretty cool, but it only has two bedrooms plus a living room and a study. But I want to live together with my two friends. So you could make the study into a small bedroom if you end up living with them. Also, we guys will want a TV and DVD player since we're all so much into movies. Well, this place has a great TV and VCR, but no DVD player. No DVD? That's so weird. Are any other facilities provided? As you said, weird enough, it also comes with a wash basin. Is there a washing machine? I think we need that more than just a wash basin. I'm afraid there's no washing machine in the apartment. Wow, that's so old-fashioned. Maybe it's not the best choice for three college guys. How much is it? Well, it's six hundred dollars per month, but of course it would be cheaper if you made it into three bedrooms instead of two. Where is the apartment located? It's two five zero zero Mead Street, where there are a lot of bars. It would be affordable, but it would get pretty noisy, and that sounds really expensive for an old place in a noisy area. How about the last place? This one's on campus in the Devon Close complex. It's a one bedroom, so it will be a little quieter than the Mead Street place. One bedroom, huh? That could be good for focusing on my studies. What else does it have? It comes with a living room and a study, and includes a really nice lamp in the study that has a bunch of different settings. You know what else is cool? There's a dining hall downstairs, so all evening meals are free. You can purchase breakfast and lunch, but meals after 6 p.m. are free. Wow. This place sounds too good to be true. Is it really expensive? It's all right, five hundred dollars per month, but there's no bathroom. What? No bathroom? Well, there's no bathroom in the apartment, but there's one at the end of the hall. Hmm. Thanks. I think now I just have to decide whether I want to live alone or not. Yeah. Which one do you prefer? I think I choose either this apartment or the one on Beetle Road. Okay. You'd better think about it, and then you can contact me ASAP. Fine. Thanks for your help. You're welcome. Good morning, and welcome to yet another lecture in environmental science. I don't think I'm telling you a secret when I mention that water is a big worry here in Australia. The stuff is scarce. Perhaps that's why we drink so much beer, eh? Seriously, though, a safe and reliable source of water is one of the great concerns of people everywhere. Moreover. As the world population grows, the pressure on existing water supplies grows greater and greater. Think about it. Our economic system demands that there be more and more consumers. The growing number of people has been tied to climate change, including droughts. So more people means less water. But our economic system demands a high birth rate. Forget about oil. Soon enough, you will see wars for water. Mark my words. But today, I'm going to confine my remarks to Australia. As noted already, here down under, the water supply is extremely scarce. The only drier continent is Antarctica, and remember, no one really lives there anyway. Moreover, in recent years, the wind patterns have changed. Rain that used to fall on the country now falls out to sea, hundreds of miles to the south. Now, when I speak of people needing water, most of you probably think of drinking. Certainly, everyone needs water for drinking, but surprising as it may sound, drinking is not anywhere near being the main use for water. Most water is actually used for washing. When you take a shower, you probably use well over a hundred liters of water. Every time you flush your toilet, that's about eight liters. But most people drink no more than two liters or so per day. So, where to get water? It could be obtained from rainwater. But often rainfall consists of other harmful pollutants that evaporated with the water. In fact, acid rain, an intense example of this, causes harmful effects on the wildlife of the habitat on which it falls. 
Water from underground could also be used, though it is more difficult to contain and often must go through an extensive cleansing process. The purest water is found in rivers, creeks, lakes and dams. And, sad to say, Australia has precious few of these. Really, how many of your hometowns have rivers? Year-round rivers, I mean. The soil tends to be sandy, so water soaks into the ground. Many places are rocky too, so 87% of the rainfall is lost to evaporation. That's almost twice the evaporation rate in my native Canada. Speaking of rain, we already heard how rainfall is diminishing here in Oceania. The quantity itself isn't the only problem either. Going back to the problems with obtaining rainwater, a further problem is that rain is a useful source of water only if air pollution is fairly mild. Again, you're in a situation where you can't win. You need water where most people live. People tend to build cities where rainfall is adequate. But then modern cities tend to feature polluted air, which renders the rain far less easily usable. OK, let's take a look at the table here. You'll see it showing the relative pollution of rainfall in the world's cities. The more people, the dirtier the rain. This is becoming a huge concern for people in the West who want their water to be pure and safe. Though reliable drinking water is important everywhere, the concern in the West is reflected in all the government regulations and political campaigns aimed at solving this problem. In contrast, there are not as many demands made on the governments in Asian and African cultures to improve the water, as their focus is on other issues. Now, whatever the source of water, we can never afford to forget that all water is highly vulnerable to contamination. Whether we're getting it from the ground, from bodies of water or rainfall, it is susceptible to a variety of toxins. In fact, that's why we clean it before using it. Water carries with it filth and dirt. This problem shows up in a number of different ways. As humans and all other animals need water to survive, it's no surprise to us that one of the most important domestic uses of water is for drinking. Yet if you have old-fashioned lead pipes, you may slowly be poisoning yourself by drinking that nice clear water. The industrial pollution, farm chemicals and leaky landfills are well-known sources of contaminants as well. So what is being done to ensure we Australians a safe and steady supply of drinking water? There are a lot of initiatives that make admirable efforts to remedy this issue. We'll be talking about this when we meet again on Thursday, but as a preview, I can tell you that so far the amount of real solutions that have been produced is not nearly adequate. Traditionally, we've been very free in this country. That means that every person in every province tend to go its own way. So the mechanisms for water management are, in a word, insufficient. To begin seeing how this is so, I want you to read something before our next class. Though a lot of previous data on water usage and water management are inconclusive and have thus caused quite a concern, we can learn a lot from the contents of reports written on the subject. The basis for the government's water policy is the 1989 White Paper reporting on water use, present and future. If you compare the numbers offered in the paper with those in the text, you'll find that the report is rather untrustworthy. Truth being told, I'm being too kind when I say that. Hi everyone and welcome to Sydney Airport. Today I'll be giving you the inside information on the day-to-day -day operations of the Australian Quarantine Service here. We hope to provide you with a better understanding of why such heavy security regulations are necessary by educating you on how we operate and why we do the things we do. We're not here to try to persuade you to fly through Sydney Airport, though we hope you'll find your experience relatively stress-free and comfortable. First things first, our personnel. Can anyone guess how many people work at Sydney Airport? We have 200 alone working in Terminal 2. So can you guess how many in the whole airport? I heard someone say 360. That's getting closer. What? Did someone say 2,000? That's way too high. Sydney Airport actually employs 440 people. A lot, right? And about half of those employees work in security-related matters. Moving on to our not-so-human employees, let's come and see our favourite pooch, Milton. Milton is our best drug-sniffing dog on the force. 
He's friendly to most people. You can even come pet him at the end of our tour. Burnouts, beware though. He'll find everything. Notice that even though there are so many of us around him, Milton stays quite calm. This is the precise reason he was chosen for the job. Dogs that are chosen are not predisposed to sniff out different narcotics. That's something we teach them already. So here's a part of the airport most people never notice, the cargo transport terminal. This is where packages are shipped to and from. Normally, we ship around 4,400 packages per month. In this airport alone, over 52,000 packages were shipped in and out over the past year. We ship to and from 170 different countries. Not bad, eh? Probably it will go up to over 72,000 packages this year. And despite over 100 flights in and out of here daily, the number of lost or delayed packages is impressively low. If you send your package through here, rest assured, we'll get it where it's going. Let's move on to the area most of us are familiar with, the passenger terminals. In order to be allowed into this area, you must pass through security with your ticket and, if you're travelling internationally, your passport. If you're travelling domestically, you just need a legal form of ID. If you don't have those, you will not be allowed to pass through security and board your flight. During the security scan, your carry-on items will be checked for dangerous items such as weapons, sharp objects and liquids that exceed our specified limit. If you attempt to pass any of the prohibited items on this list posted at the entrance, you are still allowed to board the plane, but you'll be given a warning and your item will be confiscated. Don't worry, we will not arrest you for having too much shampoo in your bag or anything like that. We also search your carry-ons and parcels for any perishable items. We prohibit the transportation of local vegetation and prohibit parcels containing any insects in them. You may or may not have learnt about this in biology class, but when some plants are introduced to a new environment, they spread wildly and wipe out the current species around it. It is important to control the introduction of new plants into an ecosystem, so we must prohibit the transport of any fertile seeds. So what happens to parcels containing possibly suspicious items? It's of course something we do not take lightly here. If an object passes through the scanner that appears suspicious in any way, it is separated out for manual search by a member of our trained security personnel. If an illegal plant or simple sharp object like a pocket knife is found, it is simply disposed of in our biohazard waste containers and the package itself is returned to the sender, or passenger, if it is for a passenger flight. More serious weapons are reported to higher authorities for investigation. As far as parcel security, the material of the parcel is important. For shipped goods, the most common material used and the most widely accepted is paper. Make sure it is packed sturdy enough with no rips or tears, We've definitely had packages rip open before due to haphazard packing. A more common problem, though, is the package labels. When an item does not make it to the right place, this is the most common reason. The label may not be in the right place or marked clearly enough. If you're receiving any items from abroad that must be declared, please remember our guidelines in order to ensure the timely delivery of your item. Make sure it is packed correctly, and we ask that you notify customs between 2 and 10 days within the item's scheduled arrival date. OK, before we move on, are there any questions? Good morning. Today we will continue our study of Crocodilus neoloticus by talking about its living habits. We've already discussed the evolutionary attributes that set it apart from its crocodile relatives. Does everyone remember that? Yes, it has an extremely narrow snout and three or four rows of protective scales on its back, as compared to two rows on other members of the Crocodilus genus. Let's take a look at how these carnivorous man-eaters live, where they live, and finally, whether they really deserve their vicious reputation. To start, I'd like to address a great question posed to me by a student during yesterday's office hours. We talked about the distribution of crocodiles in Africa and saw that they are highly concentrated in the south and west of the continent. 
this student noticed that on the map displaying the distribution of crocodiles across Africa, there were no crocodiles in the northern region and found no mention in the literature of the existence of crocodiles in the north of Africa. Why might there be no crocodiles in North Africa? Let's save this question for later in the lecture. To find out more about the social habits of the African crocodile, one researcher named Tara Shine of the University of Ulster in Northern Ireland conducted a survey of the wetlands in Mauritania and received reports of 46 crocodiles living in one group, or float as we say when referring to crocodiles, though the usual number is a little less than half of that. In general, crocodiles are more highly concentrated in wet subtropical environments near bodies of water and rich vegetation. While South American crocodiles thrive in cool rainforests, the African crocodile is more equipped for heat. Though they can survive at the hot temperatures found in some deserts, they are not equipped to handle dry climates and thus cannot survive in places like the Sahara Desert of North Africa. As cold-blooded animals, crocodiles' core temperatures fluctuate from their average of 38 degrees Celsius as external conditions change. Thus, they need to avoid extreme temperatures. Others live an underwater life, keeping a body temperature close to that of the water. As their own unique method of regulating their body temperatures, some African crocodiles have made dens by digging holes in the ground to provide themselves with a cool, dark place to retreat from the hot African sun. Speaking of the hot African sun, let's go back to the question asked at the beginning of the lecture. We know that there used to be crocodiles in northern Africa, yet today there are none. What are some possible explanations for this? Some students have suggested that the African crocodile has evolved from a desert creature into a wetland creature, thus causing them to migrate south for more appropriate conditions. Others presume that the crocodile was hunted out of northern Africa by a fiercer predator. While these are intelligent guesses, the real story is a little bit different. The key to this migration is that the Sahara Desert did not always cover the north of Africa. About 8,000 years ago, the land was fertile wetlands, perfect for breeding crocodiles. Over time, though, the area dried out and the wetland slowly turned to desert, leading the African crocodile to migrate south to the marshlands they call home today. Some crocodiles did, however, adapt to living in dry conditions. In Mauritania, some crocodiles have learned to survive in an area where they can go up to eight months with no water by spending the driest of times in what's called a torpor or short period of hibernation. To utilize every bit of rainfall, these desert crocodiles dig underground caves that collect runoff, thus staying cool and hydrated. During the mating period in November and December, males attract females to their viciously protected territory through a number of behaviours that range from snapping their jaws all the way to sending infrasonic pulses through the water. Afterwards, the female digs a hole up to 60 centimetres in depth to store the eggs for an 80-day incubation period. The female protects these eggs during the period and sometimes even helps crack the eggs with her snout at the end. These teeth-gnashing carnivores are softer than we think. Although these vicious creatures have attacked humans on a few occasions, the residents are not afraid of them. In fact, they show a great deal of reverence towards these wondrous creatures. Some say that crocodiles bring water to their habitat, so if they leave, they will bring the water with them. Obviously this is not true, but it demonstrates the admiration the inhabiting people have for crocodiles. Generally, crocodiles do not predate on humans. They attack when humans populate the crocodile's habitat, instilling fear and uneasiness in the crocs. Like any other species, crocodiles are known to attack when feeling fear. There's still a lot more to be discovered about the African crocodile. Researchers want to know more about the population size, how many crocodiles inhabit Africa in all, how they form separate floats, etc. 
there is still also much to learn about migration patterns and relations to other populations of crocodiles now found in other parts of the world. Next time, we'll examine a few specific case studies of crocodile populations in southern Africa. Welcome. Please come in and gather over here around the tables. My name is Adam Smith, and I'm the librarian here. I'll show you around today and explain how to use these facilities. Hopefully, when I'm done with it, you'll know the ropes. And please feel free to let me know of any questions or concerns that you may have. Now we're at the gate of the library. Upon entering into the door, you'll find that the restrooms are on your left-hand side, and opposite them is a photocopy room. Many of you are wondering about the check-in and check-out process. What you have to do is go to the circulation desk, which is to the east of the photocopy room. The reading room is a really large area in the center of the library, just to the north of the circulation desk. I'm sure you won't miss it. If you're here to do research, this is where you should bring books to look through. However, if you're here to do any group projects or other interactive activities, I advise you to use one of the study rooms, which are just to the east of the reading room. Moving on to the southeast corner, we have the periodical section, just next to the study rooms. We have a collection of different newspapers and magazines in this section. You can get last week's weather reports, or all the top stories five years ago. Our periodicals can be traced back 20 years to the time when our school library was built. Ah, our first question, yes. Can we check out magazines from the library? I'm sorry, but you cannot take any periodicals out of the library. You're welcome to read them for as long as you want while you're here, but you cannot check them out. I wonder if there is any place where we can get some food in the library. Do we have a store here? Of course. The Food Service Center is just meters away from the study rooms. It's on the northeast corner as you look at the map. The Food Service Center offers different kinds of snacks, though it's not big. Well, moving on along to the west, you will find the Video Resource Center on your right hand. We have educational videos and documentaries, as well as major motion pictures. We ask that you pay attention to the tag on the video that you pick up, as many of our documentaries are for on-site viewing only and may not be taken out of the library. To the west of the Video Resource Center is our satellite TV station. Here we stream the news from Channel 19 for most of the day. How many channels does it have? <laughs> it does have nearly 200 channels, but we generally will give top priority to channels with some big events, like presidential addresses or other breaking news. During the coverage of the presidential debate, students will take a break from studying and flock to watch it. Last, but perhaps most important, is the inquiry desk. It's just on the left-hand side when you walk into the library, so it's impossible to miss it. If you have any questions about how to use equipment or where to find something, come and ask the assistant. Don't be shy, because that's what they're here for. Speaking of questions, one of the questions we get asked is how to actually check out a book once a student has picked one out. If it's a fiction or non-fiction book, look for the pink and yellow checkout card inside the back cover of the book. You can also find information about the book on these cards, including its publishing date, genre, ISBN, and a log of dates it's been checked out before. Present this card to me or any library assistant, and we'll stamp it, and then the book can be kept for three weeks. You can find general information on a field of study by using one of our subject guides. We have them on paper here, but any of our computers will allow you to search within fields as well. What if the library doesn't have a resource we're looking for? Great question. I'm going to address that. Our library is a network with a number of other universities in the area, so if there is something you're looking for and it's available somewhere in the area, we'll be able to get it for you. 
However, there are universities which are not part of the network, so we do not share resources with them. If you want more information about the library and its resources, you'll find it in a labeled blue folder on my desk in the Enquiry section. Okay, so that's a lot of information all at once, and I don't expect you to remember it all. The most important thing is please be respectful of the staff, and if you need help with anything at all, come and ask me or one of the assistants. All right, any questions? Good morning, City Health Services. How may I help you? Good morning. I'd like to arrange to have my house cleaned. Certainly. I just need to ask a few questions. First, could I take your name? Yes, it's Barbara Hill. The woman says that she is Barbara Hill, so Barbara Hill has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Good morning, City Health Services. How may I help you? Good morning. I'd like to arrange to have my house cleaned. Certainly. I just need to ask a few questions. First, could I take your name? Yes, it's Barbara Hill. Thank you. Next, is your house in London? Yes, it's in Kingston in southwest London. OK, southwest London and uh, what's the postcode? SW105. And what is the square footage and what rooms will be cleaning? The whole house is 268 square feet and there is no need to clean all the rooms. I only want to have my bedrooms cleaned. OK, how many bedrooms does the house have? Three bedrooms. Oh, no, sorry, we, we used to have three bedrooms, but we only have two bedrooms now. Are those single bedrooms or doubles? Doubles. Fine, two doubles. There's one more room which needs cleaning. It was used as a bedroom before, and now we have converted it into an office. I understand. Three rooms have got to be cleaned. And are all of those rooms upstairs? Yes. Then downstairs we have a kitchen diner, conservatory and lounge. The kitchen diner is quite large and has the usual equipment, cooker with oven, refrigerator, cupboards and worktops. The conservatory has a lot of plants but there's no need to take care of them. The lounge has a leather three-piece suite and a large coffee table. Thank you. And do you keep any pets? Yeah, I really love keeping them. I've got two dogs and three cats. OK. Then if our staff come over to offer the service, please take your pets away. Uh, have you looked at our service packages? Yes, I have one in front of me. Excellent. Any extra services you need? Switching bed linen, work in the garden, clean the glass in the conservatory, that kind of thing? Uh, no. Uh, actually, replacing the bed linen, yeah, that would be good. No problem. I'll just make a note of that. How about curtains, mats and carpets? What would you like us to do with those items? The curtains. I'll have to think about that. I think we should have the carpets cleaned really well every quarter. Mats can just be done with the laundry. Of course. How about clothes? We can have our staff wash and iron them, or we can have them taken to a dry cleaner. Washing and ironing. No, just ironing. That'll be OK. OK, fine. I know quite a bit about what you want now. I should let you know that we're located on 12 Amy's Road. That's A-M-Y-E-S. Mm. And we work on from Monday to Sunday, except Tuesday and Wednesday. Could you let me know when is convenient for you? Next Friday. Uh, no. Oh, that's no good. My son invites his friends over in the afternoon that day. Perhaps next Thursday or next Saturday? Let me check. OK, next Thursday. When is it convenient for us to come over and provide the service? Is it OK if we come in the morning? Or we may come in the afternoon. It depends on your schedule. I'm OK with any time. Just give me a call to let me know you're coming before you arrive. Sure we will. By the way, how long will it take for the service? We usually work one to three hours for house cleaning and the work will take three hours at most. And, of course, if it takes more than three hours, you should pay extra for it. 
Uh, fine. So, let me just do some calculations. Hello, are you Professor Van Diesen? Yes, I am. And who might you be? Oh, sorry, my name is Tina. I'm a freshman here. They told me I should ask you for advice in choosing courses. Well, that's part of what I'm here for. Please come in and sit down. Now, what are your questions? I, I almost don't know. Everything is so confusing. Like, what is a specialized course? Oh, easy. A specialized course is one that is compulsory, meaning it's a requirement for your major and regular, so you can't place out by taking a proficiency exam. That sounds pretty strict. Then what are all these general courses? I seem to have to take so many. Nothing to be alarmed over. These are courses open to all students and not directly related to your major. The university offers these general courses to choose so that you can become more well-rounded individuals. For example, I see you're a microbiology major, so it might be a good idea to take some literature or history courses so that you can know something besides all science. You mean these courses are like for fun? That might be one way to look at it, but don't tell the literature professor such a thing. Think of a general course as the opposite of a specified course. A specified course is one that pertains directly to your major. So, can I take any microbiology course I want? Let's see. Oh, those courses used to be open to microbiology students only. The good thing is now it's open to students on a flexible schedule, so it's not only for full-time students. So, the answer is yes if you have the instructor's permission. May I ask you why you chose microbiology? Well, I also like plain old biology too. You know, full-size animals. I might even become a veterinarian. Could I take some biology classes? Well, they are open to full-time students only, which I believe is what you are. I don't know how a freshman would get along with microbiology, though, I mean, most of the students presently looking into it are from off-campus. Off-campus? Yes, you know, people who use it in their work at hospitals, laboratories, even a police detective. Why did you choose microbiology, if I may ask? I don't think you quite answered that. Well, eventually I want to be a doctor. At least my dad tells me so. If I may say so, young lady, you seem a little uncertain. Still, I think that might be a good idea for a career. Of course, if you're thinking about being either a doctor or a vet, you should take some medical science classes before you even think of applying to med school. Great! What should I take? There is one small problem. The new medical sciences building is under construction, so there are no experimental facilities available until next year. I'm afraid you'll have to wait... But don't forget to take those courses at the first opportunity. Oh, bummer. Is there any other course you'd recommend for someone like me? Well, since you seem to like animals, have you ever thought about looking into environmental science? No, I never really thought about it before. Is it worthwhile? Quite. In fact, it's the fastest growing subject on this campus. I'm sorry, I couldn't help noticing the long list of classes you've written out there. May I have a look? Oh, sure. Medical science, statistics, laboratory techniques, medicine, mathematics, computing. My, my, a bit of everything here. Is it too much? For your first semester, yes. What I suggest is starting out by taking the compulsory courses. Like we said before, the medical science can wait. Consider taking that in your sophomore year. I think I'd put off computing, too. I recommend to all freshmen that I talk to to get the compulsory mathematics out of the way as early as possible, so take that one. It'll be one less difficult course you have to focus on when the science lab opens next year, and you have to catch up on classes like laboratory techniques. Your major also requires statistics, so you have to balance two math classes and no doubt you should take that. Otherwise, get your required medicine course out of the way by taking something theory-based. Oh, of course, and your environmental science class, if you're interested. The others can wait. 
though I think computing is definitely a good idea, even though it's not required. I see, too, on your paper there, you seem to have had high marks on the entrance exam. Ah, uh, yeah, I guess so. Don't be shy. Have you thought about applying for a scholarship? Do they have any? I mean, my dad is always complaining about how much money it costs him. In your department, there are actually three full scholarships available. They cover tuition and provide $1,500 cash. $1,500 cash? Party! Please, miss, the money is intended more as a textbook allowance, not party money. If you promise to behave, I'll show you how to apply. Great, and thanks. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the second annual Wallabaloo Conference on Mastering Computer Languages. I hope you all had a good trip. Before we get underway with today's program, let me fill you in as to what's on tap for tomorrow, Sunday, February 19th. At 9 a.m., right here in the main hall, we'll be hearing a lecture from Dr. John Smith about computer as teacher. Professor Smith from the University of Melbourne is a world class expert in the field of computer assisted education, and his talk promises to be both stimulating and informative. Immediately afterwards, at 10.30, there will be a presentation of papers by various delegates. That, however, will take place in the garden room on the ground floor. If you don't yet know, the garden room is also called the ballroom and will be gathering at the west end, the slightly raised area called level two. Just look for the crowd. If you get lost, there are signs in the foyer. After all that thinking, talking, and listening, I expect everyone will be a bit weary. So at 11 15, there will be a break for coffee, cookies, and other light refreshments. These will be available at the aptly named refreshment stand, placed by the door back here in the main hall. Also, if you choose to skip the formal lunch, you can buy a packed lunch at the stand for a reasonable price. I strongly urge you, however, to join us at the formal lunch. That won't be till one o'clock sharp, so you have time to stroll about town a bit. We'll be eating at the Sea View restaurant. The restaurant is located right here in the hotel on the top floor. It's a good dozen flights of stairs, so I suggest you take the lift on the ground floor, eh? If you're not fond of fish, there's an all you can eat barbecue available as well. They even offer wallaby meat. After lunch, we'll troop back downstairs to level two in the ballroom for the presentation of further papers, which will begin at 2 p.m. Please try to be on time. I know you'll be a bit tired after lunch, but the ballroom echoes so with people coming in late. Thank you in advance. Once we've heard the papers, we'll break for afternoon tea at 3 10 pm. No need to walk. The manager of the refreshment stand has graciously agreed to have tea served in the ballroom. He's even promised us some special scones, baked from a recipe of his dear old Scottish grandmother. Then, tea being drunk and scones munched, we'll retire here to the main hall for some closing remarks and questions. So, by five o'clock, we should have the conference wrapped up. But the fun isn't over. This is Australia, mates. We'll be flocking to the hotel's own palm lounge on the east side of the foyer for an informal reception. You can relax, mingle with the other delegates, and let your hair down a bit. This will run from 5 10 to 6 10, though you're free to stay as long as you like. The lounge manager has informed me that for the duration of the actual reception, you can have all you can drink beer for $20 with purchase of an advance ticket. And yes, tickets can be purchased from any conference organizer or at the front desk anytime between now and the start of the reception. I suggest you come by tomorrow evening to pick up the tickets, since the conference hall only holds 800 people. That way, you can also get your journey planned ahead of time and be sure not to miss this truly memorable conference. If you want cocktails, however, I'm sorry, you'll have to pay for those at the regular price. Oh my goodness! Speaking of paying, I see I forgot to tell you a couple of things. The first is about lunch. The charge for the lunch will be $15 for all you delegates. If you have guests with you, the cost is $25 for the general public and $6.50 for children under the age of 
That's fifteen dollars each, not total for everyone. Another item is about the lunch menu. I very much urge you to try the fish. I mean, look at the restaurant's name, the Sea View. As the name suggests, it is a famous seafood restaurant. The chef is a Basque from Spain, and he really gets quite put out when people ignore his fish specialities for burgers or barbecue. If fish isn't your thing, though, try the steak. He makes an exquisite filet mignon topped with blue cheese and mushrooms. Finally, if you'd like to buy a ticket, you can have both lunch and unlimited beer for thirty-five dollars. I should have mentioned that earlier, but I am a bit forgetful. Maybe I should avoid the beer after the conference, eh? Well, I've said my bit. Are there any questions? Good morning, ma'am, and welcome to Australia's Moving Experience. How can I help you? Well, I, I hope you can help me. I'm so up in the air right now.、Uh... Just calm down now. Let me guess. You're moving, and it has you a little confused. That's it exactly. You see, I'm relocating to the United States next month, and I'm having a hard time getting organised. Here, fill out your name and address, and let me ask you a few questions. Oh, what should I call you? My name is Jane, Jane Bond. The woman says that her full name is Jane Bond, so Jane Bond has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen. Because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good morning, ma'am, and welcome to Australia's Moving Experience. How can I help you? Well, I, I hope you can help me. I'm so up in the air right now. I... Just calm down now. Let me guess. You're moving, and it has you a little confused. That's it exactly. You see, I'm relocating to the United States next month, and I'm having a hard time getting organised. Here, fill out your name and address, and let me ask you a few questions. Oh, what should I call you? My name is Jane, Jane Bond. Okay, Jane. First of all, what's your work phone number? In case I have any questions about things. My work phone is nine four six three triple five zero. But please try not to call me too often there. My boss hates personal calls. So does mine, ma'am. So does mine. And what address should we ship your things to? My new company is letting me stay temporarily at five o nine Clark House. That's C L A R K, one one three seven University Drive in Seattle. Seattle, beautiful city, I hear. Mountains right beside the ocean, almost. Cooler than Australia too. Okay, and when should we come pack your things?、Uh, I guess that would be on Monday, March eleventh. Do you want any help with an after-packing clean-up? We do that for a small additional charge. Yes, that would be helpful. I promised the landlord I'd give her the keys back by five p.m. on Thursday the fourteenth. Great. We'll just schedule the clean-up for that day. That way, the place will smell clean and there'll be no dust. Well, you do think of everything. Oh, how much is this going to cost? Here is a list of our basic prices. Oh dear, this seems rather expensive. Yes, ma'am, but you're paying for the best. We're careful and we're fast. Like we say, the only thing we break are speed records getting you moved. Well, maybe that's so. Oh, I nearly forgot to tell you. I don't want my furniture shipped with me. I won't be looking for an apartment till after I arrive in America. Would it be possible to put my furniture in storage here for a month, then have it sent along later? Of course, we do that all the time. A couple of other things. Here at a moving experience, we try to pack your things logically. We don't just throw stuff in boxes. Do you have any special requests? You know, things you want packed in some special place so you know where to find them. Like what? Oh, I don't know. Things like dishes, maybe. Not to be rude, but you look like a lady who likes to eat. Ah, yes. I need my dishes and things where I can find them quickly. Great. We'll put those dishes and cutlery in what we call the emergency pack. Can you think of anything else? Hmm. I do have an antique tea kettle my great grandmother gave my mother. I wouldn't want to lose that. So I guess you'd better put that in storage with the furniture. Grandma's tea kettle with the furniture. Got it. 
Say, how about things like your alarm clock? You don't want to miss your plane on the big day, right? Well, you certainly think of everything. Yes, that's right. I'll also need my alarm clock where I can find it. Fine, we'll put that in your personal package, and of course, we'll give you a list of where we pack everything. So all you'll have to do on Thursday the fourteenth is grab your luggage on your way out the door. Um, I couldn't help noticing the new CD player you're carrying. Is that a Samsung? Why, yes, it is. One of their best. Cost me nearly a hundred dollars. It did. Do you want to take special care of it? I mean, it's brand new. Take care of it, but nothing special. You can just put it in storage with the furniture. That looks like everything we need here. I guess you're all set. That was certainly quick. Thank you, young man. This has been a most moving experience. We've been talking about choosing building materials in the last week. Now, a great many factors influence the choice of building materials. You can't make a house of cards, right? And people who live in glass houses and all that. Anyhow, today I'd like to say a few words about flooring. Some artificial materials can be used, like plastic, for instance, which offer mixed blessings when used as a flooring surface. On the one hand, plastic is cheaper than nearly any other alternative, short of bare ground. Plastic also does not warp like wood. On the other hand, the best that can be said about plastic is that it looks like wood or stone. However, it cannot replace the real materials. As I have mentioned, I'm fixing up a new house. The decorator my wife hired told me plastic does a great job of looking exactly like plastic. Besides, it scratches easily, fades or discolors, and starts cracking within a year or two. So, if you're fitting out a sleazy hotel or plan to live in a trailer park, go with the plastic. Really, though, for all intents and purposes, this leaves us with wood or stone as choices for flooring. Stone and wood are alike in at least one respect. Both go through processing before they can be put to use. Since few of us cut our own lumber or quarry our own stone, this is not perhaps a pressing concern. Still, do-it-yourselfers would do well to remember to buy only properly seasoned wood. Unseasoned wood warps, and a warped floor quickly becomes firewood, and its owner quickly becomes poorer. Likewise, except for dull-hued materials like slate or sandstone, most stone floors are polished before installation. The choice goes well beyond just wood or stone. Each type requires many further considerations. A few special remarks are called for when considering wood. For example, as always, aesthetics, personal taste, and layout all play roles, as well as the type of house or room. Oh, and certainly don't forget the cost. When it comes to cost, a rule of thumb is that the softer and less exotic the wood, the lower the cost. In the U.S., for instance, pine is both ubiquitous and cheap. Mahogany is imported and exorbitantly expensive. If you're on any kind of budget when remodeling, it's really helpful to remember to go for the softer woods. Aside from cost, there are still lots of different factors that are important in choosing the best flooring for the job. Continuing with the example of wood, one must consider the effects of each type of wood on the mood of the room. When selecting the best wood to use, particular attention needs to be paid to its grain patterns, texture, and color. In rooms where relaxation or deep thought is the aim, say bedrooms or the study, dark, strong-grained woods are the rule. Here, the grain ought to match the furniture for a feeling of homogeneity. In rooms where activity and motion are typical, the dining room or living room, lighter, finer-grained lumber is more suitable. In such a setting, the wood grain might be useful in offering a contrast to the furniture. This leads to a feel of subconscious excitement in keeping with the room's function. In either case, though, consult a decorator. It is a decorator's job to know what materials to use to fit the function of the room. Though some things about putting together a room are subjective and based on one's individual taste, materials appropriate to a room's function are much more straightforward. A decorator takes the needs of the customer and uses a mathematical formula rather than subjective words. Since feelings vary from person to person, verbal descriptions of wood types tend to be ambiguous. You want the wood you select, not something approximate. And if you do decide to do it yourself, remember that all wood must be treated with preservatives to enhance its appearance and preserve its natural beauty. In the case of stone or quarry tile, as flat-cut flooring stone is properly called, a new set of considerations must be weighed up. 
Simple color aside, the degree of reflection must be kept in mind. This is called the reflectance rate, which is expressed in a number between 0.0, .0 and 1.0, depending on the amount of light it reflects. At one end of the scale is polished silver. At a rating of 1.0, this shiny surface reflects nearly all of the light directed at it. Numbers closer to zero describe materials that absorb more light. Moving down the scale a bit, we see that plastic that has been painted white has a rate of 0.8, which makes sense. We know that the color white reflects all other color, while black absorbs all color, and plastic itself is a relatively reflective material. Materials that are denser and darker have reflectance rates much closer to zero. The quarry tile I mentioned a while ago has a rate of 0 0.1. As you may know, quarry tile is generally dark brown and made from clay, so it is quite dense. Of course, there is considerable variation among types of quarry tile because of the hue or treatment of the clay during its creation. Does anyone have any guesses as to what material may have a rate of almost 0.0? .0? We can guess most of these materials are black in colour, but plastic, wood and even stone reflect some light. One material with a rate of almost 0.0, .0 is black velvet. The texture produces almost no shine at all. Carrera marble, despite its white hue, is actually lower in reflectivity than black onyx. In any case, the fact that tiles vary somewhat should not be forgotten. A highly reflective floor would not be suitable in a library. It would be indispensable in a ballroom, should your home be large enough to feature one. Again, a rule of thumb is that light means lively. Since form and material follow function, one should only use the more reflective materials in rooms where the cultivation and expression of energy is important. Bear in mind, too, that most types of stone cost more than all but the rarest of wood. Of course, there is no reason why some rooms of a house should not feature wood floors or other stone tiles. You can even mix the two. A room with wood panels on the walls can have a beautiful stone floor. My bedroom has white birch walls and a light blue slate floor. The place looks like a Russian hunting lodge. Remember though, go with what feels right for you. Good taste and the laws of interior design are the homeowner's servants, not his master. It's only beautiful when you decide it is. I mean, you're the one who lives there, not the decorator, right? Okay, are there any questions?